Pong name ever uh, that even I cannot remember, and it's now called Developer Testing Automation, etc., etc. That's a bit more civilized than automate all the things and make developer, development easier and better. Uh, Just we have a bunch of talks today, each of which are about 20 minutes. Uh, we, there is room for Q&A uh, at the end or in the middle, depending on which individual speaker feels like. Uh, but enjoy it thoroughly. I'll let each speaker introduce themselves. They do a much better job of it than I ever do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's get going. With, uh... No, before we even start, can some of you move to the centre? Because there are going to be people coming in late. We know that because they're still out there. If you don't want them to, if you don't want them to interrupt you, you know, by walking across you. Going to the center might be the best. Or coming right up to the front. Everyone's very friendly, can they? I'm not, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you bite. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and all our speakers will take wonderful deep breaths and deep <laughs> and, uh, Everyone, questions loudly. We'll have a microphone somewhere that I will get some running packets up and down the stairs with uh, and falling over probably as well. But uh, let's go. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, so I'm Nick Coughlin. I work as a provisioning architect for Red Hat. So how work on a bunch of our internal systems, how we deploy them and thing. Uh, this presentation was actually supposed to be given by a colleague of mine, Amit Saha, uh, who's one of the developers on our hardware integration testing system. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it, so I'm filling in. Um, so, one of the big projects we work on is Red Hat's hardware and, um, integration testing system. So the thing that lets everybody else not worry about the CPU details and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and so, yeah, and so this is... <sighs> Thank you, Firefox. Um, so yeah, so I'll just go through a little bit about what Beaker is. Um, what the hardware inventory system is and some of our unique requirements, um, how we go about creating that inventory, and then the actual bulk of the talk will be about an interesting migration problem we've had recently in terms of uh, having to replace one of the key components for collecting that inventory data. Uh, and if people want to follow along with some of the links in the slides, uh, that link there um, is a MIT's Fedora People page. Um, so yeah. I'll give you a chance to grab that if you want. So what is Beaker? Uh, so operating system company, or operating system, one of the main things we do. Our hardware integration testing requirements, a lot of things that people, uh, other folks can abstract away and just test against the OS and let the OS worry about the hardware. We actually need to worry about testing against the hardware. Uh, and so Beaker is the open source um, beakerproject.org hardware integration testing system that we use to actually test Fedora, CentOS, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Project Atomic, all that sort of stuff running on bare metal, pre-configured VMs, dynamically created VMs, Docker containers. Um, we basically try and make sure that the operating system actually works in all those contexts so that the software running on the OS doesn't need to worry about it. Um, and so Beaker basically lets you set up uh, tests across multiple systems, uh, combinations of bare metal and VMs, um, different hypervisors, uh, all sorts of interesting stuff. And then group, you can also group them together such that you say, does this test work across all the architectures, see, uh, see which architectures are failing, all that kind of thing. Um, all the stuff operating systems companies do so everybody else doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, I've got a much more detailed talk about this from last year. Um, link to the videos in the slides, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, so as part of this, we need to maintain a hardware inventory of, like Red Hat's got thousands of systems in our main Beaker instance. We need to be able to give people access to those. People need to be able to find the systems they want to do the testing they need to do. Now, most hardware inventory systems, so if you look at things like OpenStack Ironic, uh, on metal, all that sort of stuff, they're, they have a fairly abstract view of what constitutes a computer. They'll go, oh, well, you can say, um, 
what kind of CPU architecture you want. You can say how much RAM you want. You can say how much disk you want. But it's not very detailed. It's, a very, it's, it's the abstraction that the operating system gives you. Uh, when you're trying to test the operating system itself, you need a bit more detail. You, don't, you not only need... Um, you want to know not just what architecture the CPU is, but you want to know what version it is, you, like down to what specific options that CPU provides, whether the BIOS has um, hypervisor acceleration enabled, all this sort of fun stuff. So you do care about like CPU flags? And yeah. Like yeah. So I'll, uh, we'll show a little bit more detail shortly. Um, and so... So, for example, if you're wanting to check that does the operating system work properly on Intel Celerons, then you'll say, well, Intel Celeron is actually family 15 from Intel's point of view. Uh, and so Beaker will say, oh, well, we know that this is a family 15 CPU. Um, that's a bit obscure for most people to try and remember. Uh, and so we actually have these predefined host filters that you can say, look, give me an Intel family 15 Celeron. Um, and so you can just kind of search through the list of predefined filters uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's currently only available through the command line interface. So like a lot of things, techie, the, the web UI will get you started. Um, but if you're doing this day in, day out, you just want the computer to take care of it for you. Um, and so a lot of the, um, in, in some ways, the command line is actually easy to use because we've got some of these niceties built into it that we haven't made in made available through the web UI yet. Um, so yeah, so it's things like Celerons, uh, so you can get down to the detailed CPU family rather than just the architecture. Uh, you can pull out stuff like um, not just how big the hard drive is, but who the manufacturer is, uh, what the driver controller is, and so you're, it, it's, a lot of it's built around actually testing um, driver compatibility, or all of the abstractions that the operating system provides this is the system that lets us test that that actually works and that works, works in a way that we can support. However, there's no way you can realistically maintain that stuff manually across thousands of machines. It's just not going to work. It's going to get stale. It's going to be wrong. So we will automate the task of collecting it. You just run a job on the system. That says, OK, look at the box. What's here? What's, what are the, all the details we need? push that back up to the server, and then the server makes it available for searching and selecting systems and all that good stuff. Uh, and so that's a project, sub-project of Beaker called Beaker System Scan. Um, and you can see a subset of the data there. Uh, this particular scans from a PowerPC 64-bit machine. Um, it's virtualized, so the CPU flags, there aren't any um, because it's not running on a real machine. Um, Model number gives, often gives a lot of details about what the capabilities are. Model name, this one, particular one's a Power 7, four processors, um, virtualized, so there's no physical sockets, um, details of the speed, who the vendor is. Uh, that's CPU stuff. There's then generally a lot more info around various other bits and information. Uh, so Beaker System Scan itself is mostly a Python application. Uh, and you can run it independently of Beaker. So you can just install Beaker System Scan and see what info it gives you about the system. Um, so that's then showing some additional info about the hard drives. Um, and so, yeah, so it tells you what's the actual model of the disk, sex size, total size, um, a lot of the stuff around large scale systems, non uniform memory architecture, that kind of thing. So you can scan for how many NUMA nodes does the platform have? All that sort of stuff. Uh, so Linux exposes a lot of stuff through the PROC virtual file system. Um, get a bunch more out of libparted. Uh, and then the, there's then not built directly into system scan itself. We try to use the OS's own capabilities of self-reporting what, what the available hardware is. Uh, and so for a very long time, Beaker's used a project called Smolt. Uh, this was part of the Fedora hardware census that reported back to the Fedora team 
uh, where Fedora was being run. So it was one of the things that you could opt into during Fedora first boot to say, we're running on this sort of system, here's the hardware details, all that sort of stuff. Small, um, unfortunately, reti got retired quite some time ago. Um, and what that meant was that Beaker system scan, so Smalt, the Smalt's native reporting capabilities actually stopped working years ago, um, which is why it got retired from Fedora. Um, Beaker wasn't using the reporting capabilities, it was just using the hardware scanning capabilities. And those kept working uh, right up until relatively recent Fedora. Um, but unfortunately, even those eventually stopped working and Fedora dropped Smalt entirely. Uh, and so what that ended up meaning was that we got into a situation where our hardware scanning capability would run on RHEL 6, wouldn't run on recent Fedora, wouldn't run on RHEL or CentOS 7. And that then we had ARM, ARM v7, ARM v8, and new generations of Power, P Power PC, our inventory scanning system wouldn't run because those architectures aren't supported uh, in RHEL 6, or PowerP64, little ending, I should say. Um, those architectures aren't supported in RHEL 6. The old scanning software only ran on RHEL 6, so we had to, we had to fix something. Uh, one of the options we looked at was just taking over small maintenance. So you adopt the project, either fork it or just take maintenance. Didn't really want to do that. Um, Small had been dropped from Fedora. Uh, they were replacing it with a different project called LSHW for list hardware. Um, and so it seemed like a more sensible option was to go forward and try and figure out, well, okay, can we take, Small has a designated successor in the OS, can we migrate our own scanning capabilities over to that? Uh, and that's, uh, that's something we're in, currently in the process of doing. Uh, and it turns out that, yes, this is actually entirely possible because LSHW has an XML output option. So you can basically take LSHW and say, give me the XML, and then process the XML to transform it into whatever format you want. And so what that lets us do is create a new version of Beaker's system scan based on LSHW rather than small. Uh, and that lets us still support Itanium because RHEL 5 is still supported. Yay. 32-bit uh, <laughs> um, x86, 64-bit x86, uh, IBM S390 mainframes, uh, PowerPC, um, ARMv7, and ARMv8, so the AH64 on the end there. Uh, and so, yeah, the new version of LSHW basically lets us support all of those by running the inventory on RHEL 7 or CentOS 7 or a recent version of Fedora. Um, and so, now that said, we've got the interesting requirements. We need to do things on R&D's timeline uh, rather than necessarily have, being able to wait until new versions get into a release of Fedora uh, or even longer timeframes for RHEL or CentOS. Uh, and so what we actually do is we actually maintain our own LSHW fork. Uh, and pretty much the purpose there is we're not trying to replace LSHW. It's what the fork lets us do is it means we can actually try out our fixes and improvements ourselves uh, and update it on our timeline uh, and then work with Lionel upstream on getting our changes back into uh, upstream LSHW and then hence on into Fedora and so on and so forth. Uh, and what it means is it makes that for a far more positive dynamic in the way we work with the upstream project uh, because it means we're never in the situation where we have to get something into upstream to meet our own deadlines. It, it means that our fork runs on our timeline and based on what we need to do uh, and then we push it back upstream and work with Lionel to get the changes into a form that he's happy with. Um, and so yeah, and so that, that downstream fork just creates a really good separation between the interests of the two projects and lets us work together far more effectively. Um, and then the main, the main situation where we need to step in and add stuff uh, is mostly around the fact that a uh, vast majority of the open source world 
we're just all working on x86. Uh, most of the time, um, Red Hat supports a whole bunch of other architectures that that make more have more of a presence in the data center than they do on end users' desktops. Um, and so yeah, and so that's where a lot of our contributions there. And if you that link in the PR there goes through to thing. Uh, one of the other things we're working on as well is trying to provide an automated test suite for LSHW that you can that actually provides reference data for these other architectures, um, such that you can you can run it against dummy data and dummy uh, procf uh, procfx and all that sort of stuff, uh, such that even if you're running on x86, you can check that you haven't broken any of the other architecture scanning capabilities. Um, that still needs that still needs some work to get it into a form Lionel's happy with to accept upstream, which is fair enough. Um, so in the meantime, we're pretty much just we'll throw new versions against our um, these hardware we have access to and say uh, we broke such and such and we'll fire bugs and keep stuff working upstream as needed. Um, however, there's always fun fun times when you're replacing a long-lived system. So Big has been around several years now. If we break major parts of it, for some reason the company gets very upset. Um, and so we kind of need to be careful that we can't just rip Smolt out, throw LSHW in and say, hey, here's the new one. Uh, we would really need to check, are we collecting all the same stuff that we used to be able to collect? Uh, if people go searching for systems, are they still going to be able to find them? Um, and so, essentially, what we do, or what we've been in the process of doing, is we still have the existing small page tasks. Uh, we have the new LSHW based task, uh, and we'll just run the. We'll take a single. We'll take multiple systems across all the different architectures, run both scans on them, and say, are we getting the same answers? Um, so we obviously can't do this for ARMv7 uh, and ARMv8 because the old one didn't work there. Uh, and so we already just use the LSHW one there the, because it's like we just don't have, that's the only way we can scan them. But for existing architectures, we just want to be able to drop the old small one entirely and just use LSHW. Um, and so what we basically do is we've just been going through and saying, right, Here's the answer we get for from Smolt. Here's the answers we get from LSHW. And any time we get discrepancies, just try and figure out what's what's wrong. Uh, so in this case, for CPU, you can see that yep, we're getting the same answers from both. All good. Um, but in other cases, we're starting to find that no LSHW really has gone backwards in some areas relative to what Smolt used to be able to provide. Um, and this, so like this is an example where, like if the capitalization changes but the information's all there, we don't really care. Uh, but if we're seeing things like, in this one, uh, LSHW is currently not picking up what the driver is for BERT devices. Um, and so that's kind of a problem because if you're trying to test a particular driver, you need the inventory data to report what you've got. Um, and so that's the so the current situation we're in is we're actually pretty far along in the process of replacing it. Um, most of the stuff that we need to fix that was missing in SLHW is fixed in our branch. Uh, we still have some issues with the drivers uh, and device reporting that we're not quite sure why LSHW is giving us the wrong answer um, or or is missing missing data or missing devices. Um, and so yeah, so that's that at the moment is still under investigation. We're trying to figure out is it that LSHW is just not providing the info, or are we not reading it out of LSHW's reporting correctly? Um, and so yeah, so that's that's the current status. That's what for, that's what Amit mainly is working on in this area is doing the rest of that analysis and getting us to a point where we can drop the old small base task entirely and migrate fully to LSHW. Um, and so yeah, and so there's a lot more detail about this in the upstream design docs, 
uh, and dev mailing list. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one I find quite interesting just because it's that lower level of detail that th this is all the stuff that operating systems hide from everybody, that, that we worry about it so other people don't have to. But I still think it's cool. Um, so yeah, and so this actually started off as an intern project um, and then has been migrated into the main development cycle of Beaker. So, cool. I, any questions? Stun silence. Maybe. Oh, it works. Um, does the, the list of hardware that Beaker supports um, affect the hardware that Fedora supports, for instance? Is there any sort of tail wagging the dog or um, like So for Fedora, uh, Fedora historically hasn't run its own Beaker instance. Um, we're trying to get that fully up and running for beaker.fedoraproject.org. Um, that's partly driven by the, there were, with, with the Anaconda rewrite a couple of Fedora releases ago, um, which then came into RHEL 7, we found some interesting regressions uh, <laughs> when we started doing RHEL 7 testing. Um, we're like going, okay, that's kind of silly that we're not doing that testing upstream in Fedora. Um, and so, yeah, so we're actually starting moving more of that upstream into Fedora. Uh, historically, Beak has mostly been focused on the RHEL CentOS side, um, but yeah, we're, we're certainly trying to move more of it upstream just to shorten that that cycle time between. And, um, uh, does does Red Hat have a you know a massive room with thousands of every kind of machine? Uh, uh, yeah, we've got several thousand machines scattered across the planet, all hooked up to a giant Beaker instance. So. Cool. Thanks, everyone.